Hello, everybody. Uh, again, I'm David DiCarlo. Thanks for attending this webinar. Everybody out there in TV land or YouTube land or whatever land we are nowadays. Um, so I'm gonna, this is for the Center for Sur Subsurface Energy and the Environment webinar. What is the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment? This is a group of us at UT who are all studying uh, flow and processes and inside and outside of the subsurface and how it relates to um, both energy production and energy storage. In particular, today we have this, this, this smiling face right in the middle. Dr. Larry Lake will be presenting today. I'll give you a little bit more information on his uh, uh, work in a second. Uh, a little bit about CSEE, uh, just the acronym, make it easier. We do a whole bunch of different work in subsurface applications, certain disciplines, certain engineering tools. Uh, if you have any questions on this, there's questions that is a question and answer part for all of these things. You can just read the list. I'm not going to read it for you. There's a lot of interesting topics here. So this is our monthly webinar. Uh, again, these are informative industry driven webinars by researchers and collaborators of CSEE. Uh, these are every Tuesday, second Tuesday of every each month at noon right now via Teams, which you're watching it on. And these were all going to be uploaded on the YouTube channel, so you can watch it out in YouTube land in a few days. OK, so today we have Dr. Larry Lake. Upcoming, we have Matt Bailhoff, Julia Gale, and Hugh Daigle in October, November, and December, respectively. OK, so important point here, questions and answers. If you have any questions on Dr. Lake's talk today, please just enter them in the question and answer section whenever you think of them. They will just stay there and be ready at the end, and Dr. Lake will then uh, proceed to answer all the questions he wishes to answer there, probably all of them, if they're good questions. Um, I don't know if he'll answer a question on his hairstyle, but he'll answer other questions. So um, he will take care of them at the end of today's presentation. Okay, for today's present presentation, we have Dr. Larry Lake. Look at the smiling guy in his nice clothes. He always wears nice clothes to work. Uh, his, his talk is on scales, scaling, and scale up in reservoirs and understanding porous media and all these different scales. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Larry Lake, and I'm going to hand it over to him. Pleasure to be with you. I'm uh, talking about a subject that has been kind of near and dear to my heart for uh, some time. Now, not going to claim we have too many answers, but I will, will claim that uh, we might very well need a, a, a give you a different perspective on the topic. This is scale, scaling, and scale up. If you're an old guy like me, you might remember back when movies used to show a cartoon before movies, or sometimes even uh, in uh, between movies in a double feature. So there is going to be a lot of cartoonish-like stuff in here uh, that uh, is not particularly uh, very technical until, uh, until we get to, uh, to the, the very end of it. So, <clears throat> This also is kind of a, uh, a, a rehashing of a talk I gave gosh, several, years, several years ago for a, a, a applied mathematics uh, workshop. So uh, it was interesting reviewing it to see how well things had changed. So here's our talks. Uh, there'll be five bullets, there'll be a motivation. Uh, there'll be a generic look at scales. Then there'll be a kind of a hone in on one of these things called scale up of dispersion. And then finally, some closing thoughts. You can see where we are in the talk by how you see these bullets appear. So here's what I think is true. As far as we know, as scale increases in, in this presentation, scale would be a, a, a same word as size. The lateral permeability increases. And to substantiate that, here's a figure from a work by Carolee in 1979 that shows the hydrologist uh, permeability on the on the vertical axis and the scale of the measurement. This is kind of a schematic plot, but there are a lot of measurements be, uh, behind it. And you can see in quite a compressed scale down here, in fact, from uh, 10 to the minus 1 to 10 to the 4, that's five orders of magnitude. You can see as the scale goes up, uh, the permeability goes up. This slide actually tries to attribute it to some geologic causes, but I think it's probably as much that as it is um, as be statistics. In fact, um, I think what it is is as the scale goes up, there's more of a likelihood of catching a high permeability streak in, 
in the in the medium, and that will cause the average permeability to go up. And I <clears throat> would like to say that it, it has cap happened very often in my past when I would get a phone call from an operator, and they would say things as well. Um, uh, I mean, I should not be able to produce from this field. My core data says that it's just impermeable, but when I put the well in, it does it does fine. So lateral permeability increases with scale. As far as we know, <clears throat> and this is actually tied to the previous one, ultimate recovery decreases with scale. This slide shows the ultimate recovery as a fraction of the residual oil and remaining oil saturation on the vertical axis. And the, um, excuse me just a second, I'm trying to make make the uh, there we go and the rock volume, the volume over which it's measured on, on the horizontal axis. Again, big changes of scale, 12 orders of magnitude and a lot of scatter. But you can see there's a clearly a, a, a decrease in recovery as as the size of the experiment goes down. We have got a lot of data points that would fit in up in here. If we were put in all of the data we had from from laboratory scale measurements up in here, it would literally blacken the upper left hand corner here. So there is it's a trend. So and this is again is tied to the idea of heterogeneity being more important at higher scales. As far as we know, <clears throat> dispersivity, this is a plot that shows dispersivity versus the distance over which it's measured. Dispersivity increases with scale. You're going to see a lot of this plot at the at the end of the presentation here because I've done a lot of work on this topic. Uh, notice both both scales are log log scales. Uh, the scales are log log, and even so, there's a fairly substantial amount of scatter. But even with the scatter, you can see that the bigger the scale, this is the distance over which it's measured, um, the more the greater the dispersivity. More about this later. Well, other things which I can show, but uh, you get the idea. It, uh, as, as scale increases, vertical permeability decreases, relative permeabilities tend to straighten out, and residual saturations increase. I think the last one is, is tied up with the, uh, the uh, decrease in recovery. Matrix fracture transfer rates increase also. So let me move on to a generic look of scales. And I'm going to do a series of slides that will make the following points. In nature, there are many natural, many natural objects and there are many sizes, but all applications have at least two scales. There's one scale that is called the window scale. That's the largest observable thing. Usually it's the size of the, of the frame. And the second one is the pixel scale. That's the smallest resolve, resolvable feature in the, in the picture. <clears throat> Both of those scales are human scales. They're not actually uh, in, present in, uh, in, in all of the different scales that we will, we will look at. So to me, that, that, tell, that tells me the notion of scales is kind of a, an imposed uh, thing by uh, humans. <clears throat> it turns out that the pixel scale informs the larger scales and the, that process going from the small scale to the large scale is what's broadly known as scale up. So let me go to uh, another slide. I want to go to this one. About 20 or so years ago, there was a book published. It was called Powers of Ten. Actually, there's been a couple of books published on this. This is from the original book by uh, Ames Office. And it shows a photograph of somebody, man here, at the at the meter scale. So the size of the uh, uh, the size of the picture is about a meter scale and I've drifted back to not having that laser point again. Well, that's OK. And so what I want to do is I want to go go in to smaller scales as we go forward and then after we've done that, we'll go up to larger scales. Now I want to, you to uh, I want you to notice how much the pictures change as we go in or uh, how difficult it was it would be to say what was in the previous scale if you just had to if you just had to work on one scale. So here we go. This is. This is going into one scale. This is the centimeter scale. It's focusing on the guy's, guy's hand. Well, I think at this scale, you could probably tell that was the skin, but you can't really tell whether it was a man or a woman. You can't really tell whether it's what's beyond that. And so we have a technique, technologies for stepping beyond the scales here, but 
there's no guarantee that they will work beyond it. And <clears throat> on the next slide, I've basically reproduced that picture, and I put over here what I think is is photomicrographs, porous media, at the corresponding scale. So this is the hand, and this is the scale corresponding to the reservoir for the hand. Going down the scale, this is 10 to the minus 2 measures. This one, you probably would guess that that's a skin, but you can't tell whether it's the hand or the cheek or anything like that. <clears throat> In fact, uh, it is, no pun intended, it is the pore scale. So <clears throat> it's uh, basically 10 minus 2 uh, meters. And you can see a picture on the right hand side is a manifestation of what we would think of as a pore. And so the grains in this picture on the conventional reservoir correspond roughly to the size of the pores over here in the skin. Uh, but once again, you can't really say what was on the previous picture just from looking at this one right here. <clears throat> one more. This is going way down. This is going down to the millimeter scale. <clears throat> this is really the pore scale. So here's the pore. And uh, there's a picture of the uh, uh, of the rock. Just as you couldn't really tell what the larger scale is from this, <clears throat> you couldn't really, you can't really tell what the larger properties of the rock are from this alone also. So that's going down. And then <clears throat> even further, and I don't have a picture from Eames office here, this is 10 to the minus 4, this is 10 to the minus 6. And, and once again, it's just very, very different from what you, you saw at the uh, at the first slide. And so going to back to my first nurse notion, this is the window scale. And these things in here are the pixel scales, the smallest things that you can see are over here. So let's go back and let's go the other direction. This is the, the guy standing again, I mean, laying on a, on a blanket again. And <clears throat> here's moving out basically by one foot. Now, in reading the book of Eames' office, in fact, they've actually made a, an industry out of this, it turns out this scale is the most difficult one to do because uh, it's, it's not far away, but it's not so close either. So what you see in it is the, uh, the post up to a, a, a post that has the camera on top of it. But you can see that if you guessed that there was just more like this out here off to the side, you would be very wrong because it's just this guy laying on the grass in here. So, but once again, the uh, window scale, the whole thing, and the pixel scale, as well as all sorts of things in here, you can look at the scale as in here. You might even have trouble seeing that there's a man there. But <clears throat> let's go up one more. This is the, uh, uh, the 100 meter scale. And now you can barely see the blanket here. And you can see that he is on a grass grassy area in here you know, like this, uh, but surely can't see the blanket and surely can't see the man. The whole picture changes just as we stayed on one scale. Now let me go to this one. This is the, the one meter scale and this is the hundred meter scale. And the reason why I did this is because this is kind of a recognition that scales have a certain directionality to us. This is a, a cross section of the page sandstone. And the length from left to right over here is the 100 meter scale and the length from top to bottom is a one meter scale. So in addition to having many different scales, sizes, these scales all would depend on the direction that uh, that uh, that the that what is being measured. So going up again, this is the kilometer scale. Now you certainly can't. In fact, you can barely see the field in here right there. There's the field. Uh, certainly you can't see the man that's in there, you can see that there's some sort of a stadium over here and maybe even a body of water up here, but all these details are just completely lost because they're below the, the pixel scale here. And then putting that next to a uh, basically a cross section, I think that was uh, constructed by seismic in here, this is basically the things we'll look. All of the previous details that we saw on the, on the uh, on the, on the smaller scales are just missing. They're just, they're just too small to see. So going up again, there is 10 to the fourth. And if 
of the Midwest that was a start you look familiar to you, maybe. This is the 10 kilometer scale, and here's a picture of a reservoir model generated by a capacitance resistance model, which uh, we, we, we invented here at the University of Texas. And I think it's, it's one of the, the few ways that you can do to model entire fields are basically scales of the order that are tens, uh, tens of kilometers, as this one here is. So once again, the thing I said, you hardly can tell. You can't even tell there's a field there anymore. When you, look, when you look at it. <clears throat> so all these scales that were on the Eames office show up, show up here again. Now that, in the book, they go to much higher scales and much lower scales and things like that, but that's where I'm gonna stop. So <clears throat> the conclusions, let me sort of repeat, repeat myself. There are many natural objects, sizes. And there, are, every object has at least two scales. Scales are based upon human observation. And then I guess the question rises to me is what's the right scale? Maybe the right scale is a decision scale where you decide what to do with your reservoir. But that's just kind of changing from one definition to uh, impossible definition to another one. Uh, what I am con pretty, pretty convinced of is that there are many researchers and many uh, geoscientists that never get beyond one scale. So if I don't do anything or don't accomplish anything in here with this presentation, is to help you see that there are other scales. Okay, moving on. Let's talk about dispersion. Something that uh, is frequently gets neglected in reservoir engineering calculations. Something that I've studied for a long time, and I hope I'm closer to a uh, to a. Uh, a resolution of it, but um, <clears throat> dispersion scaling, scaling starts right there at the uh, centimeter scale. You've seen this picture before, <clears throat> and we can think of it on the pixel scale basically as as a bunch of mixing tanks like this. Chemical engineers love this, or we can think of it as this very very basic model where there's flow through a tube, and there the concentration changes because of the differences in velocity between the wall and the other. Dispersion has been measured through something called a dispersion coefficient. That's the vertical axis on this slide. And the horizontal axis is called a Peclet number. It's basically a dimensional velocity. This has been measured many times in the literature, and it all turns out to be about the same thing. When, when the velocity is low, the dispersion or is mixed, it is, is Pretty much close control by diffusion. When the velocity is high, dispersion gets much greater than diffusion. And if I let you look at this, you would see that the slope of this line is about one, eh, give or take, one, maybe 1.2. And there's a slide suggested here this is convection dispersion controls, and here is diffusion controls. So <clears throat> another way to look at it here, this is going back to the uh, uh, to the picture. Uh, that I showed earlier is that if I look at a little piece in here, that um, that is that is, is is the scale of which this figure applies. But if I come over here and look at the whole cross section, that's the scale at which this figure applies. I remind you again, this is dispersion versus distance. So there are big differences in behavior and the scales. So let's go into it a little deeper. Here is dispersion. As a look at dispersion, and let's imagine we have a core, and to do the simplest possible thing is to put a pulse of tracer over here at the inlet, and as it flows with some carrier, carrier gas or fluid, uh, dispersion causes mixing zones to develop between the fluid that was injected and the fluid that's driving it, and similarly between the injected fluid and the initial fluid, so much so that the mixing zones can overlap and the peak will fall. And any effectiveness of this fluid that depends upon the size of the peak, of course, will be greatly influenced by, uh, by dispersion, by mixing, if you like. And I'll probably use those two terms. So it's been studied a lot. And in terms of math, this is the equation that, uh, that describes it. And the solution down is the bottom of it. Now, I hope I don't run people off with this, but this is a little bit of math. 
And you notice something that's very interesting in here. There's a velocity there, but there's an air function solution, which is sort of implying that this whole thing can be looked at in a statistical manner. So here we are again. <clears throat> and here's the solution again, and here's the picture here. And so I can look at it as a phenomenological thing, like uh, like we did on the previous slide, or I can look at it as it's like a statistical thing, which is here, because that equation is very similar to the equation for a normal distribution. And in fact, if I view these concentration lines here as, uh, as the probability of a set of, of concentrations being at a location that is in fact the same as a normal distribution. The probability that a random position of particles is in the vicinity of, of a, specific, uh, a specific location. Now, <clears throat> I took some slides out here because I was afraid that the uh, presentation would go a little long, but let me make a point there is that this is a a phenomenon that 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 applies to a whole bunch of things. It applies to solvent efficiency, you know, solvent flood efficiency in EOR, not just solvents, but chemical flood efficiency. It applies to saltwater intrusion in coastal aquifers. In fact, this is water diffusing into uh, water, so there's no, not much other effect than just a uh, dispersion effect. <clears throat> it applies, believe it or not, to dune migration something that I discovered uh, by accident. I'm still not sure it's right, but I think it is right. It, uh, it applies to the fate of groundwater contaminants. And there's a lot of anything, any, anything that involves two fluids in a permeable medium uh, is going to be susceptible to some extent by, uh, by dispersion. Now, an interesting thing here is that in a lot of cases, it is not the dispersion itself that's all that important. It's what it causes that is important. And, and a good a good example of that is is the, uh, the so-called residual oil to emissible flood. CO2 floods or, or uh, natural gas floods and things like that. And a number of, number of studies have illustrated that the efficiency of the solvent flood, like the first bullet says, goes way down if there's a lot of dispersion in the system. And the efficiency as manifest by the so-called residual oil to the missile flood or SORM, the efficiency is directly proportional to the recovery efficiency. And that's far more important than the than the the effect of dispersion by itself. But of course that is caused by dispersion. That's a thought I would like for you to hold if you can is that there are effects that kind of cascade over upward from the, from the small scale to the large scale. And it's the large scale phenomenon that's really the most important. So once more, oh yes, I forgot mixing of gases in underground storage for sure. You know, I forgot that was there, okay. So once more, that's the figure again. And uh, it does, to me, it, it actually, it took, took me a while to realize this was a question because I've been phrasing dispersion as though it was a, uh, a mixing phenomena and, and the way it's measured, it probably is. But I'm wondering if it really does mix, if it really does mix on a local scale. Now, Steve Bryant and I had a, a student many years ago who did this on, the, on a core scale and it really does mix on a core scale. He, he did it by basically measuring uh, the dispersion at points in, in a pore. But how about going upwards? Now, let me review again some of the, some of the thoughts of dispersion mechanisms. And all of these are good up to a point, <clears throat> but they don't completely explain all the observations and I will, I will, uh, I will try to, uh, to point them out as we go along. The first one is molecular diffusion. Well, of course, we all know diffusion and that is a nice tie because diffusion has a statistical basis too. But if when we're in a molecular diffusion regime, the dispersion coefficient is proportional to not velocity. And if you stress saw data that dispersion is uh, is strongly a function of the velocity of, of the flood. So this doesn't explain everything. It does explain a lot of things in a very low velocity region. 
Another one is well mixed in. So personally, I, I like this one uh, because I can visualize uh, mixing cells for e each one of the cells. The solvent tracer comes in here is mixed. And it comes in here and it's mixed in each one before it goes, it goes to the next one. And if there's enough cells, it's pretty amazing that uh, it, it the the outlet of the of the large number of cells on here has a pretty good dispersion character to it. In fact, it's fit by an air function solution. But I'm hard pressed to figure out what exactly are the the physical meaning of these things in the pores media. I don't believe that they are individual pores because it's hard for me to believe that in every case each pore is well mixed before we're moving on. I, I should have said earlier that we're talking about uh, we're talking about missile fluids. So this one has its problems, although you do get a dispersion coefficient that is proportional to velocity in this. The third one is uh, Taylor's 1920 paper, Statistical Transfer Theory. And uh, you once again going with a, with a uh, uh, heuristic or historical angle to this. This is a 100 year old paper <clears throat> and uh, by G.I. Taylor. It's not necessarily the problem that people think of when they think of, of Taylor. This is his early, early paper. And what he was trying to do was trying to quantify the mixing of smoke as it goes out of the chimney like this. And he did it purely, he did it purely statistically. In fact, he basically calculated the mean distance of the variance of the mean of a uh, swarm of particles and allowed those particles to be correlated. And he finds out that if the if the distance here is is much larger than the correlation length, it does just fine. If the dispersion goes to the first power, <clears throat> and in fact, if the uh, correlation length is much larger than the distance of which is measured, it goes to a distance to the first power two, and it has a coefficient of variation in here. And another parameter, lambda, which is analogous to the mean free path length in the diffusion theory. So this is good. I'm hard pressed to believe that this was reversible. It's hard pressed to believe that if you were to suck the smoke back in here, that would you would get uh, uh, all of the uh, all the smoke back. So let's go to another one. Now I'm quite a bit simplifying the whole notion here because there are many papers of Taylor's uh, uh, and, and other people's over the years. And, and then, frankly, these are a little bit dated, but they're all very nice. Uh, and this one is probably the nicest one of all and probably the one that most people think of when they say the Taylor's problem is that we will, we will imagine we have flow through a tube and the tracer is injected over here and because there is no velocity at the wall, the, the tracer adopts this little bit of a crescent shaped pattern in here. <clears throat> and that causes there to be concentration gradients in the lateral direction. And those concentration gradients cause spreading of the fluid to be laterally. And if you go far enough, and that's what the equation up here says, if you go far enough, the lateral diffusion will completely smear out the velocity gradients and you'll get a course which looks like this. Well, this actually happens in porous media, or at least in porous media simulation, because here is a picture of a simulation through a layered media, one, two, three, four, and five layers. And you can see if the, if the average position is close to the inlet, you can see the layers. But as you get closer and closer to the inlet, you get some transverse dispersion in here, the layers kind of disappear. And even though it remains a heterogeneous medium, it uh, it looks like it's mixed. In fact, if I consider that zone right there to be the mixing part of it, this is a lot more mixing than it is over here. And this theory has been modified so much over the years that it's now become a standard way to measure diffusion coefficients in in the small scale flows. But I would still like to know if things are really mixing, if things are really reversible. As you see, they're mixed here, but they're not, not here. So let me go up again. This is not a very good slide, but I'm going to stick it in here. It's a bit deterred. It's, it's, it's uh, deteriorated with age. But here's a simulation. 
into a four layer media. And you can see that there is a distortion of the front over here because of the different permeabilities in the layer. And if you look inside here, there's also mixing inside the layer. This mixing inside the layer is a lot smaller than the mixing here. But <clears throat> if I reverse the flow, and that's where I'm going with this section, if I measure the outlet concentration here, it might look something like that. But if we reverse the flow, the front positions in each layer more or less come back to each other. And what I'm looking at here is really dispersion, but it, it's mixed. Now, it's mixed differently in each layer in here, but the, the so-called effect, the effect of uh, the, the gross layers in here is canceled out in a large, to a large extent. Uh, a dispersion measured at the outlet of the system is called a transmission dispersion. And dispersion that is measured at the inlet of the system is called uh, the echo dispersion. And I, based on what we just saw here, I expect the echo dispersion to be substantially smaller than the transmission dispersion. But this is a, uh, a yet again a rendering of that same figure, and you might have a little trouble seeing it. Here's dispersivity versus distance. And these points in here that are kind of lightly shaded or shaded are echo data. These come from single well tracer tests. And you can see they're really on the same trend as the other one. Oh, they might be a little smaller, but they're certainly not a lot smaller. And so they're, as far as we can tell, the echo dispersion and the transmission dispersion are about the same. Now, I've got a succession of very good students to look at this. This one is a Jagannath and Madhavan, who worked on this particular one. And interestingly enough, here's another one in here that uh, this is from Abraham Johns. And he's showing the position of particles. So we start off right here, and he flows to the left, and you can see how the particles' positions are clearly more diverse and diffuse. And if you put simulation in this medium, but it returns, it even becomes more mixed, more mixed. But when he doesn't put any dispersion in it, when it returns, it goes back more or less to where it was. So in order for there to be mixing, even though there is transmission dispersion, in order for there to be mixing, there has to be some small scale effect, maybe diffusion, maybe laboratory scale dispersion that causes this picture to be like this. I think I said earlier when we were talking about this that uh, uh, that is the, the small scale kind of feeds upward to the large scale, and this is a good example of here. This is his results in a different uh, in, in a different uh, uh, format. So on the left hand side here, he's plotting the dispersivity here versus the mean position, and this is for in the bottom here. This is for a permeable medium that's not very correlated. And you can see there's not a great difference between the transmission and the echo, which is coming back. But as there is long a mixtures of correlation links, there become more and more of a distance. In fact, the transmission dispersion would be this value here. Sorry, the echo dispersion would be this value here. And the transmission dispersion would be the values here when the flow starts uh, to, to be reversed. So they look pretty close. I, I don't know whether I kind of believe that or not, but it's it, it, this work tends to make it uh, seem so. And it, there's a lot more to be studied about this. So let me kind of wrap up here a bit. Some closing thoughts, OK? So <clears throat> think of physical properties appear to depend on scale, size, and I showed you Dispersivity, I showed you permeability, and uh, uh, I forget what else I showed you. But they do appear to depend on, on scale, the scale of the measurements, and I think they depend a lot on the scale of the measurements. So we have to kind of acknowledge uh, that that this is true, that, that what you see in the field may not necessarily be what you see in the laboratory. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, 
Well, yeah, I know this, but that's why we have simulators. So we can take the small scale properties that are on the grid size and uh, put them into the simulator that gives me the large scale behavior. You're right, as long as you know what the behavior should be. In other words, you know that the permeability should increase with scale, the specificity should increase with scale, so on and so forth. It's related to dependency of heterogeneity on scale. As we said, the interplay with subpixel scale effects. So just because I said it was below the it was below the pixel scale, it don't mean that it's not important. <clears throat> and I have to say, even though I don't fully understand it, I'm not even sure I fully believe it, there is a substantial mixing in flow through permeable media. This is kind of tough on some of us who tend to model displacements as though they're piston light in the in the flow. So no dispersion without diffusion. So here's the, pa the papers, and you'll notice some of these are pretty old. We continue to work on this, and there are many people, besides the ones that are shown on the list here, uh, and except for the first one here, they're, they're all at University of Texas, or were University of Texas people. Now, I'd like to uh, finish with just a couple more of those, um, of those scale up pictures. And so here we go. This is scaling down. This is a hotel. I think it's in Dubai. Maybe it's not. I, I thought I knew where it was, but it's become a real famous picture. You can see the whole hotel. Maybe it's not a hotel. Maybe it's something else. Anyhow, you see a little platform here, and we're going to narrow down on it. And if we drop down a scale, you can see the platform clear. We can't hardly see that there was a hotel there or a building. But we can see it. And if we narrow down a little bit, you can just barely begin to see that there's somebody hitting a golf ball off of that platform, but the building's lost. And if we narrow it down again, you can see even clearer, you can't see anything except the guy hitting the golf ball. And we narrow it down even further. It's Tiger Wood, who used to be a famous author, author in the United States. So this picture is very different than the last picture. Now, just to kind of spruce things up a little bit, when I was I was uh, uh, looking through the web the other day, I found out found this picture, which is more up to date. This is a picture of the same thing, except they're playing tennis on that platform here, and the same comments are there. But I can't really uh, I, uh, I I can't really zoom zoom in on this one. So. Anyhow, that's the talk. I hope that you, you enjoyed it and I'll be happy to answer questions. It says, why is it called scaling up rather than scaling down? Well, there are some people that, uh, that do scaling down work. They try to infer the small scale from the large scale. Uh, that's true, but I don't think it's very futile. And, it, and the same thing is, uh, is uh, uh, it's, it's like if I give you an average of a set of numbers you can't really tell me what the numbers are. You can just tell me what the average is, and and so it's the same thing by scaling down. You can only you can only do realizations of it. So uh, that's why I think it's scaling up rather than scaling down. This is from my old friend Steve Bryan. What we see in the field is usually based on samples from a well, which means millions of individual streamlines have been mixed together in the sample. And if we could measure concentrations at say the millimeter scale all along the well, each individual stream of individual streamers would it get different values of field scale dispersion. Well, yeah, uh, it, it seems like you should, but based upon what we did, and I say we because you were involved here too, it doesn't look like as much different as you as you think it would be. So uh, there's there's something going on that I'm, I'm still not quite sure. I uh, I understand. So there should be less dispersion on the middle millimeter scale. It's the difference between the mean of the variance and the variance of the mean. Uh, but uh, based on what we've done so far, it doesn't seem like much. This is how does the scale of a sample impact data dispersion in a data set? What are the implications for this for interpreting results in statistics? Well, it is statistics. And you might recall 20 or 30 years ago, there was a branch of uh, something called the Statistical Transport Theorem. It's probably still around. It was, it was pretty powerful, but it was one of the ways we introduced the notion of geologic correlation into the, uh, 
into statistics, which had been largely free of autocorrelation up until the end. So uh, <clears throat> I forgot what the question was, but it, anyhow, it uh, uh, it seems like you can tackle the problem both ways, both from a statistical point of view and from a phenomenological point of view. Both will require some data. Let's see, please, could you share a little more on the mechanisms behind reduction of missile flood recovery due to scale? That's a really good question. And all I can say, it's a kind of a phenomenological observation, uh, but it, these are dispersions. These are these are floods that tend to be developed missile. And if if they're well above the missile limit, then they're pretty much pretty much the results are are, are independent of uh, dispersion, but if they're kind of at the stability limit or a little bit below it, below it, evidently the mixing that goes on inside a pore or whatever a representative volume is, is enough to, to keep it from attaining this ability. And so several simulation studies have showed that the more dispersion there is, the less uh, uh, recovery there is. Thanks for the question. Ah, what drives decision scale selection? That is a really good question. And since the, the windows scale and the dispersion and the pixel scale are kind of man-made scales, I think the decision scale would probably have to be a man-made scale too. It's whatever the decision maker is comfortable with. And when I'm asked this question before, I you know, usually say, would a decision maker be comfortable with doing implementing a CO2 flood, for example, just based upon core flooding measurements or slim tube measurements. And I think they think they would not be. So the larger the scale of the measurement, the more it, it, it affects the, uh, the decision. And I think decision scale is always on a larger scale. Maybe it's an equally interesting question to say, can you be too large? If you're considering one flood in one field, is a regional scale heterogeneity really relevant to you? So anyhow, I'll dodge the question a little bit by saying it uh, depends on the observer. Does the phenomenon of dispersion also affect immiscible flow, water floods, etc.? Do we ne need to worry about it there? Of course, we always consider numerical dispersion, but does mixing dispersion need to be considered? OK, I'm going to give you the, uh, the official line on this one. If we're talking about immiscible fluids, there is something like capillary pressure, which uh, uh, occupies uh, phenomena much like dispersion does. It causes, causes there to be mixing. So the traditional way of modeling it is to just leave out dispersion when we're modeling, uh, um, modeling uh, immiscible displacements. But there's a tiny little bit of literature that suggests that may not be so, that suggests there's an additional effect. And uh, so I'm just going to say that it's possible there is, but I just don't know. So anyhow, thanks for the question. SWCTT are impacted by irreversibilities. For example, fracture close on production or perforations can unplug. Do you think these methods invalidate using SWCTT to understand irreversibility? Well, it doesn't invalidate it. It just adds more, more things to the list of what causes irreversibility. So uh, we, of course, did not uh, take that into account. And in, in, in many of the original single well tracer tests, uh, there was a problem with fluids drifting off to the side. And, and we tried to account for that, and they tried to account for that too. Uh, these are all largely uh, conventional production, so I don't know if I would say that that was a large effect. Can you comment on the applicability of stream modeling models if dispersion mixing occurs at multiple scales? Well, <clears throat> it depends on, on what you're trying to do. If your idea is to, uh, uh, if to study sweep and large scale phenomena, uh, streamlined models are just fine. If you're trying to study the effect of, uh, of mixing or dispersion on, say, uh, uh, say the recovery or the residual saturation, they need to be uh, augmented. But, but I will say, uh, many of the streamline models do have dispersion added into them, so they kind of affect that as, as much as they can. What effect do you think different scales can have on thermal conductivity and other thermal properties of rock? This is a 
a guess, an educated guess, but I think they would have the same effect as permeability would. Is that thermal conductivity would get larger as as you go to big to uh, larger scales? That's a guess. Thanks for the question. I think it's an interesting subject, and I I would uh, very much like to uh, uh, like like to have some more uh, people working on it. It seems like uh, there's there's kind of like uh, two types of people on on this. There's that people just sort of do large scale models and hope it all comes out in the wash like all the airs kind of uh, cancel each other out. Or well, there's people that study on a particular scale really most of their life and um, and know there's larger scales or smaller scales, but uh, don't do too much on it. So that's my last comments. Thank you very much, all of you, for your, for your uh, attention. <laughs>